more people will join in as uh, we proceed. Um, okay, so um, Jacob Cooper is the author of Life After Breath. And it, as he discusses some of his biggest takeaways and lessons from when he crossed over and went to the other side during his profound near-death experiences as a child. During this meeting, Jacob will share his understanding that you do not have to wait to die to get to heaven. You can find it right now. Jacob facilitates lesson wisdom and tools to bring the infinite awareness of the soul into this finite body and moment. Visit Jacob's website. It's, uh, it's on the email. And it is such an honor to present you, Jacob. So we're going to just uh, let you say your story, and then we'll take uh, lessons from the members. Welcome, mm -hmm. Jacob. Well, thank you all uh, for taking your time out here this evening. And I've heard so much about you know uh, this group from my dear friend Tina and how you guys are really evolving and learning uh, from different near-death experience encounters. And uh, some of you might have had your own and some might know someone who, who has someone. But I, I do think either way, uh, near-death experiences are really um, evolving and changing and becoming a lot more of a household name, uh, particularly with um, the Surviving Death documentary on Netflix, which uh, featured several of my colleagues. Um, and hopefully, it might still be on there, but if you can, I, I highly suggest you taking a look at it because it's a very comprehensive outlook towards uh, not just near-death experiences, but a multitude of levels of uh, higher consciousness. Um, so I come to you guys. Uh, I live in Long Island, New York. I ironically just presented out in Ridgefield, Connecticut yesterday, which happens to be my father's home where he grew up in the 60s. Thank God he's not listening because he wouldn't like me telling his age. But uh, I, I, I present there around, you know, almost 60 years later. Uh, but, but I know you guys were mentioning the University of Connecticut. Uh, before I start, I want to tell you something about the University of Connecticut. Uh, my father was a, is a UConn grad in the psychology program. And one day I was reading a book by Kenneth Ring. And my dad looked at the book and he said, you know, he, he was my professor in like the late 60s. Uh -huh. And this was maybe right on the precipice or maybe before he was, you know, getting started. He was just a regular psychology 101 professor there kind of. And now, you know, he's just blown up. And I know my friend and colleague, Laura Lynn Jackson, mentioned him in her book, um, The Light Between Us, just in terms of her reading on him. But... You know, Kenneth's a remarkable pioneer of NDE researchers. Uh, so if you haven't heard of Kenneth Ring, uh, do check him out. Um, but, you know, one guy who's on the cover of my book, his name is Dr. Raymond Moody. He endorsed my book, Life After Breath. And uh, I do have a lot of credit for Raymond uh, because Raymond really coined the term near-death experience. And what I, I had, I'll get into my experience in a bit, but what I, I wouldn't be able to really talk about my experience without the vernacular or really the definition of a near-death experience. Um, it gave me the universality of it, uh, but for around you know two decades, I really held it in to myself and reading another encounter's book um, allowed me to ha have an understanding of universality behind it. And so I think these meetings are just so pivotal uh, because it, you, know, you just never know who is listening, who is watching, and the empowerment that will provide to someone's experience that doesn't necessarily have to be an NDE. It could be a shared death experience, an out-of-body experience. Uh, but we all need a lot of support and empowerment uh, behind our experiences because, you know, the world is still a little bit asleep. It's waking up a little bit, but uh, this is a, very much a group that's awake and aware. Um, my experience, you know, happened around 28 years ago, around this time. It was September of 1993. And uh, to give you a little bit of my age, I I was three years old, um, you know, at the time, and you know my my experience is a little bit different than conventional near death experiencers, where the trajectory is, you know, you look at a doctor, I've been Alexander, you know, most people they're usually midlife in their 30s and 40s, you know, they're having this pre-human experience, then all of a sudden they have this profound 
experience and they, they no longer could look at reality in the same perception. Um, and I can't speak for other experiencers, but from my own experience, this happened before I was, uh, you know, largely programmed in the human condition. I was still a very young infant, although I was, you know, starting, you know, to, to get conditioned in a way and to kind of forget who I was. But I think the whole goal of near-death experiences is just to remind us that once we know that we can never die, we know that we can only live. And the experience really told me that. Um, you know, but my experience happened in September of 1993. It was, you know, around this time, like I said, and I had at the time uh, something called pertussis, otherwise known as whooping cough, uh, which, you know, for infants, children, and, you know, even rare cases, adults could be fatal if not treated early enough or properly. Uh, and so for myself, I, I was not vaccinated at the time, and I caught it from, you know, a friend in the neighborhood. And a couple of days later, my brother actually caught it enjoying me in the hospital. Um, but I had whooping cough. And, you know, ironically, I released my book about a couple, about, about a year ago. And it happened, you know, during the time of COVID. And I didn't do it necessarily intentionally, but there was just so many ties uh, between, you know, what I experienced in whooping cough and, you know, losing breath and, you know, what was happening in the COVID period. And so uh, my goal, hopefully, after this talk is, to recognize that yes, we have the breath of the body, but we also have the breath of eternity in ourselves that can never be taken regardless of what happens to the body. And this breath is a breath of creation. And I, I experienced that, you know, once I lost my breath, that there was a whole new breath that can never be taken from me, regardless of, you know, the breath leaving the body. Um, so, um, you know, my experience happened in September, 1993. It was right before the, high holiday of Yom Kippur, and I grew up in a Jewish Orthodox background. Um, and, you know, Yom Kippur in the Jewish tradition, you know, is, is you know, I look at it in my language as almost kind of like a day of abundance or a day of manifestation. Uh, but it's really called the high holiday, a uh, high holy day, where your soul is preparing itself to, to meet the creator and trying to rid yourself of any ill will or negativity or um, a thing that you might have done so that you're ready to, to, to meet the creator to manifest a year of prosperity, abundance, you know, health, well-being, you know, all that um, good stuff. Uh, you know, little did I know I was about to meet the creator, but it was a far different creator than depicted, um, you know, within uh, the confines of my religion and certainly organized religion. And, you know, I think that um, spirituality exists not because of religion, and but, but I think really despite of it, you know, and there's something more, than, than just that's that's within the confines of religion. But I don't want to make this a time to knock on religion. I I let it, you know, run its course and everyone has to find their own conclusions, um, you know, with respect. Uh, but I went to a park with family, friends, um, and, you know, it was a beautiful uh, September morning. And, you know, I was, um, as I was going to the park, I was quite excited to go to the park. I went like any no you know, other regular day, uh, but there's something auspicious about this time, um, you know, when I was when I was going there. And within time, I decided to go, you know, up on a slide, you know, up on a ladder onto a slide. And as I was climbing up different rungs of the ladder on the slide, I noticed that my breathing became a lot more belabored and difficult as I was climbing each rung. And at the top of the slide, I just noticed that my breathing was was not working. There was there was nothing going on. I was uh, slowly suffocating and it was resuscitated. Um, there was nothing that I could inhale. And that was the most traumatic experience that I could ever, that I certainly had in this lifetime, um, which which leads me to my understanding as a psychotherapist as to how I remember this. Um, we speak about 9-11. You know, I was in around in sixth grade I don't remember what I was doing 9-13, 9-14, but I remember what happened exactly in 9-11. And I think that really has to do with the impacts on trauma, the impacts on something so profound in our ability to retain it, no matter how old or how young we are. Uh, so I'll get to some of those questions because that normally is a controversial element, which I, I embrace because that causes, that, that allows people to think a little bit differently, which I think is a good thing. Um, and so. Uh, but as I was climbing up, you know, as I was getting to the ladder, everything began to shut down and my body was no longer functioning. And I, much like if you're in your car and you try to 
start your engine, you notice that your engine isn't working. You're not going to just hang out there in your car. You're going to try to go out of your car and check the engine out and see what's happening. And so my body was not responsive. It was, it was, it was totally just, it was just a meat suit that wasn't working. And so, you know, my awareness, my consciousness left my body and just tried to look at it from the disembodied state. And at the time, I became a lot more aware of my body and my brain from looking at it uh, from from the disembodied state. And I was just aware that my body was no longer functioning. It was it was as if you take a power breaker in your basement and you shut off every you know breaker and every component, and you know nothing w was working. And the last part that I was aware of was my own brain. I was able to look at it and also feel my brain and to be aware of this intense pressure that was building within my brain. And I was able at the time to really understand a lot of different neurological components of the brain. Bear in mind, this is coming from you know, not a three-year-old or not someone who went to a program in neuroscience, but you know, someone who was out of my body. And I, I think it's true that they say we use a very small, limited percentage of the brain. And certainly the brain you know, has a difficult time understanding itself. You know, it's it's limited in its ability to understand other components, but its own. You know, it, we're still rather limited in neuroscience. But I was able to understand my brain and, and different functional components. And slowly but surely, I noticed that my brain was beginning to was was suffocating, and it was no longer functioning properly. And you know, instantly, moments later, I felt a large crack or large snap within my brain as if you take a plug in the wall and just yank the plug out. And, you know, the plug is your spirit tuned into the body or the wall. And I was no longer, you know, tuned into my body or my brain. I was just, you know, became, you know, totally out of my body. You know, there was nothing, no part of me that was able to really go into my body because my body, you know, was, was totally, was totally gone. It was very flatlined. Uh, and then in that moment, I just began to just notice my own consciousness, my own awareness, uh, travel on an infinite journey uh, to upwards and upwards, you know, where there was no limitations. I was aware of myself going into this familiar like tunnel structure, the best way I could describe it. And I was noticing myself vibrating, you know, upwards and upwards to no end, you know, and solely I, I entered this, this beautiful dimensional light that was quite familiar that I've seen before. And what I just became aware of was just this intensity of euphoria, this intensity of sounds and colors that had no real comparison with anything on this plane. It was beyond any of our descriptives or any of our you know, wildest imaginations. It was clearly uh, a higher realm and a higher dimension beyond this you know, limited uh, earth plane. Uh, but I just, the best way I could describe it is I was going on this roller coaster ride to an infinite mm -hmm. eternity. Of, of euphoric feelings, sensations, and awareness. And this place was, to me, home. It was a familiar place, but the journey was very much to the innermost part of my being and my own awareness. And it was just coming back to the eternal ocean of creation. And within moments later, I was able to become aware of my body, and I was able to look at it, and I looked to the right part of my brain, which it really corresponds to the creative part of our, you know, brain. And I became aware of this beautiful golden palace, you know, right, right, you know, behind the right side of my head and my brain. And this golden palace, I was able to look at it through, you know, my mind's eye and, you know, the eyes of my spirit. And I was able to see colors and sounds that were so, uh, that were so profound that I just had to shield myself because it was just too overwhelming for me to see. But this palace, every time I looked at it, I just noticed myself going on this endless journey where there's no possible limitation of my euphoria. The euphoria had no possible limit. And that's something diametrically opposite that we're used to in our body, where no matter what, there seems to be a cap or close-endedness of our euphoria within our body, because we're limited bioneurochemically. But when, you, when I was out of my body, there was no apex, there was no limit of euphoria. And I was able to look at this, and the best way I could describe this palace was, uh, you know, just the vortex or just the center point or the endless apex of life as we know it. It was the highest point which everything emanated from. And the best way I could describe that in just simple terms was God. Um, it was just the center point of God and, you know, the flowings of creation. 
from this eternal light. And at moments I was able to just be aware of the angelic choir that was in this light and frequencies and sounds and this eternal golden palace that was to the right of my head. And it was so profound that I just almost had to shield myself from just, you know, the adjustment of being human and going into this completely different realm. It was, uh, you know, very um, diametrically different than, than what I was exposed to for those three years of my life as, as Jake or Jacob. Uh, and moments later, I became aware of this brown, I would call brown or kind of bronze, you know, color. I'm sorry, this, this bronze or gold-like color. Um, excuse me, it's a little bit late at night, so sometimes my wording isn't exact. But this color I was aware of. And, you know, just in the distance, I would just saw just these flashing lights and this, and this whisper. And then in this whisper, I, I became aware of just this, this vibrational frequencies um, and, and this vibrational frequencies, you know, I best known as, could best describe as this Christ consciousness. It was just this whisper of, of Christ consciousness that I was hearing and almost this higher octave um, on the other side. And, uh, you know, I think we're used to ourselves coming in physical form, but who we are are just octaves, different expressions of the divine. And so when I was hearing and feeling this as we are all divine, this was a very high expression of the divine. And I was feeling this. And in this moment, I became aware of human thoughts that had still attachment to my three-year-old body and to my family and what was going to happen when I crossed over. How would my family take it losing such a child at such a young age? Uh, what would happen? What would I look like, you know, if, if I held on? And if I leave this behind, I, I'm leaving, you know, uh, what could have been and I'm and I'm leaving it all behind and moments later I was just very much uh, enveloped in this radiance warmth uh, and the best way I could describe it is is all is well all was always well and all will always be well and this clear notion of that is so different than our regular world experience where we live you know in our linear minds we're used to pensing ourselves up for what's stressful on Tuesday or Wednesday or something that we thought about in the past. We're not used to eternal peace without no time, without no linearity of time. And this was just, you know, me going into this place of eternal peace uh, where there was no doubt, there was no separation, that this was the true core of life in itself, that everything is well and fine as is. And you are perfect just as you are, and there's nothing that you need to do for that. You just need to express and remember the simple awareness of your eternal being and the eternity of love that surrounds you and that's inside of you. And in this moment, I was able to just get beyond the linearity of life, and I was into this place where there was no time. There was just pure love. There was pure peace. There was pure understanding that this is all that there is and ever was, and everything else fades just like the ocean waves, but I was back into the eternal ocean of reality as I knew it. And the moments later, I became aware of myself on the top of the slide. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny how the other side works, where what could feel like hundreds of years on this reality is milliseconds. It's almost if, if you take a look at C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, which is really based on the life of you know, Jesus. Uh, and it's an allegorical reference to it. But when they enter the wardrobe, when they enter the closet, they go into this other realm, which feels like hundreds of years, and they see themselves aging. And then they come back, and there was no time that ever lapsed. And that's kind of how things felt on the other side, where time here is so different from there. And so there was no time that really passed in what felt like an eternity of being on the other side. And moments later, I was able to be aware of myself on the top of the slide. And then I saw my two spiritual guides who were by my two sides. They were a male and female guide to the right side and left side of me. And they were, you know, I think a lot of people are able to hear guides or feel guides, but this was actual, you know, physically seeing guides right in, right to the sides of me. And they were right just beside me. Uh, and they were just massive in their beauty and their, in their, majesty was something beyond any descriptive word. They were just the most beautiful beings that I could ever put. And I just remembered a feeling of sheer embarrassment that I that wasn't coming from them, but rather was coming from my own judgment 
that I lost sight of them, that I forgot that they were, they were there with me at each step of this journey, that, that they were the closest extension of my soul that was possible. Uh, they were they were me, basically. They were they were who I was, and just a profound connection to, to every thought, every deed. You know, they knew who I was with transparency, without any limitation. You know, and seeing them, I felt a great sense of reunion. I felt the sense that uh, for an embarrassment that I that I lost sight that they were there the entire time. They never left me. My awareness left them. My limit my limited awareness in the body. And slowly I was able to see my guides, my female and male guides, just allow my body to be pushed down the slide. And slowly my body um, was, you know, on the ground flatlined. And I was aware that my guides went down the slide with me, enjoyed me. And and in the time I was able to be aware of every participant that I went to in the park on that day. And they were looking at the meat suit or the body and they were calling my name and I was irresponsive. And I was aware that I had a form where my body was on the ground, but my form was to the side of my body. I felt a shape. I felt a form of my soul. And uh, I was trying to scream at the top of my lungs to, to speak to them, to touch them, to grab them. And I could see them and they could, couldn't see me. And that was even more suffocating than suffocation itself. And it was torturous that... I could see them and they couldn't see me and it was it was very difficult and I felt my guides you know soothing soothing me down and you know telling me it was okay and you know but they were trying to speak to me and then moments later I became aware of their thoughts and so much more about the people in that day that I didn't that I wasn't privy to on an intuitive level I knew you know what they were going through emotionally I felt their thoughts and I felt their own angels and spirit guides I was able to see as well as their auric electromagnetic field that surrounded them and each participant. And in the book, I talk a little bit about premonitions that I had of my own sibling that came true of that time. But it was as if time and all of what I knew prior to was thrown out the window. And I had such a greater depth of understanding of not only myself, but also, you know, the pe people around me. And I think the inner always reflects the outer. The more connected you are in the inner, so to the outer. As above, so below, so to within, you know, so to on the outside. And, you know, moments later, a clear thought and a clear understanding of, of spirituality that this wasn't something that just some people had. This was who we are to a core. You know, some people remembered that, embodied that a little bit more, but it was truly our true sense of, of, of our core being. And I just had this clear understanding that this lifetime was not some biological random existence, that there was a, there was a higher understanding, there was a higher energy guiding us, that we all came from spirit, go to spirit, um, and we were here to really remember who we are and what we're forever connected to. Uh, and moments later, I just became aware of this thin veil that was right in front of me, and right in this thin veil that separated the physical realm on the other side, just a couple ticks beyond our reality was an endless array of angels that were floating right in front of me. And as I looked at these angels, I just became aware that, yes, the other side could feel like it was a million miles away, but it was also right here on this earth plane. Heaven is right here. Uh, we are not just here to bring heaven and earth. We are literally parts of heaven here on earth. This is heaven. Heaven is around all of us. And as I was looking at this endless array of angels, I was able to look at them. And I saw that while the spirit guides were a lot more, more micro-focused on myself and contracted to myself, the angels that I saw that were floating in the distance, they were a brown, kind of like a, a brown bronze type of color. And when I saw them, you know, I could feel their own vibrations. I could fear, feel their own, you know, sound. It was so intense. It was so loud when I was able to see it. But I saw a sense of uniformality that they were all pretty much the same. And they were just here to really serve, you know, God, so to speak. They were here to really be servants of the light. Uh, they had no identities. They had no uh you know agenda other than just to just be servants of the light and there was just these eternal beings 
just eternally serving light. That was who they are. They were light beings. And then the moment I was able to feel and sense the radiance of light that they were sharing to the planet at large and how all these angels are here right in front of us at all times, all around us. It's just this thin veil that separates us through the limitations of the body and our own consciousness, our own vibrations. But a couple of ticks, a couple of vibrations beyond this reality is an endless array of angels. Um, and moments later, I became aware of my own soul family members that were able to come very slowly in the distance. And as I saw them, I again felt that same similar sense of embarrassment when they came in front of me. That wasn't coming from them. They were very warm and they embraced me fully. Uh, but but it it came in a sense that I, you know, it's almost as if you're, you have a, a big party and you're going to the military and everyone celebrates you and you have all these big plans. And then a week or two later, you say, oh, it's not for me, something like that, and you just come back. Or if you go to a summer camp and you leave a week or two after it. And that's kind of what it felt like when I saw them. I felt that there was this this big orchestration of my life and all these plans. And a couple of years, you know, a year or two later, I was, three, year, three years later, I was coming back to them. But I was able to be soothed that they they didn't love me for what I did. They generally loved me for who I was. And it was something so diametrically different that I experienced uh, in those three years of life where there's just this undeniable, unconditional love for loving who I was and not what I did. Um, it wasn't anything that I needed to do to earn that degree of love. And moments later, I became aware um, of, a, of a pivotal choice that I needed to make. And this choice, you know, happened, um, you know, in a sense of asking me what I would be doing if I was you know, going to stay on the other side with the light beings and my angels and spirit guides and and God as the best way I could describe it as, or, you know, I, would I continue living my life as, as I was? And I said, if, if I did decide to stay, you know, what, you know, was the, what was this life about and why was I here and what, what would become of this life? Uh, I wanted some certainty. I wanted some guarantees you know, to, to sell me that this lifetime outweighed the other side. And, you know, in moments later, I became aware of different images um, and I was shown different screens of other different carnations in which I chronicle a little bit more in Life After Breath. Uh, but the most, um, you know, recent uh, scenes that really struck me was a life in which I took my own life in my last carnation, which evidential mediums, psychics, and intuitives have been able to pick up prior to me going public and the different scenes and everything that happened was able to have evidential readings and evidential uh, information behind what I saw, uh, not only uh, my near-death experience, but also sub subsequent, you know, past life recollections as a child and young adult. Uh, and in those moments, I just became very emotional with the different students that I taught in that lifetime, while also remembering, you know, the moments and the different scenes and when I took my life and when I did cross over to the other side and feelings of my back being against the wall, of seeing no hope or no end, and I saw clear parallels with the karma that I have of, of this experience, which was to truly remember, you know, that regardless of what happens on the outside, what's in us is infinitely greater than any challenge in front of us. And what real, what is real can never be threatened. What is unreal can never really exist. And only the eternity of love as who we are is the only thing that is truly real. And it was a lesson that I needed to remember in those moments in which I felt paralysis to really help people out in their own moments. Moments later, I was able to be aware of different participants that I would be speaking to, you know, in my life to really bring this message, you know, to allow people to re-remember who they are and what they're infinitely connected to um, and letting go of what we've been taught. And um, I said, as beautiful as the other side is, you know, this message. Um, is is profound because it told me that you didn't need to die to get to heaven, that we could live right here in this lifetime, that the body didn't need to separate us from the other side, that we didn't need to wait to get to that point. We could really embody it within our everyday lives by really being connected to this inner being, this inner eternity within ourselves and, you know, really connected to that place and living from the inside out. And from the power of choice, I 
said that I, as beautiful as the other side is, that's, that could wait. This unique window of time was something that I wanted to really be a servant of, was something that I really wanted to serve, love, and remember within every life, with every moment that I had. And moments later, you know, all the different spiritual entities and guides and light beings, you know, left my immediate awareness. And I was left with, you know, a period of, of doubt as just, what did I just do? Um, I just turned down heaven. I just turned down the other side coming back to this to this lifetime and i just i was just kicking myself around and you know the awareness was you know really from my own guides was that everyone has has a life path everyone has infinite intelligence in this path but but there is a power in trusting our our own inner knowing and trusting our thoughts because those could really shape shift in you know, the life that we live and it's very important to really be tuned with our ability to trust in our own knowing versus our own fear and uh, moments later you know those guides beings and i was able to wake up on a cold hospital bed with my mother who was very emotional and and saw me and i was alone in the room with my mother in the hospital bed um, and uh, moments later i became aware my mother tells me of this that i was so struck with trauma from the period of suffocation as well as the intensity of, of, of the incredible adjustment that I had, that within a, you know, moments later, I began to have a big rage within myself. And I, I literally got physically aggressive like a day or two later with the doctor because there was such a degree of trauma and suppressed, repressed emotions that I was struggling with, you know, as well as the diametric, you know, opposite reality of being on the other side and then coming back to a cold hospital bed. Uh, you know, and this trauma, you know, really stuck with me for quite some time. Uh, but, you know, I, I noticed that, you know, after this experience, I was able to become aware that from the suffocation due to my body, that my brain was much different. I was, and I speak about this in my book, there was this light energy that was able to go into my brain. And I had just this awareness of higher consciousness of this wisdom this this endless array of wisdom you know flowing through my own immediate awareness and i was a lot more comfortable living in that place and going to the other side as a young kid in moments of quiet and moments of solitude than being in this in this body uh, but there was one particular memory that stuck with me where i was really tuning into different you know animal spirits and different beings on the other side and i looked to a classmate in preschool next to me and i asked if he saw those beings too, and they looked at me with such a perplexed look, and you know, it was just this feeling that I felt just so alone and so different, that I decided to really keep all of these experiences, you know, very much sacred and close to my own being. And I really didn't tell a soul for around two decades. I would say, you know, probably in my later teens. So it was around a decade and a half when I first began to really process this, but this was just something, my own experience, and it was just so sacred that I didn't even bother to have, you know, limiting words or to take a chance of, of uh, telling anyone for the fear of ridicule, the feel, feeling that it just wasn't worthy of having words describe, you know, all these beautiful feelings and sensations and euphoria that I experienced. And so I kept it you know, very much close to me. And so, I was kind of this guy who was trying to um, bog this beach ball down in the water just to kind of fit in. I had all these experiences and I was very much you know, teased for being a dreamer. And I was put into a world that fell in love with regurgitation over imagination. And so, you know, as a kid, I was in and out of therapy. I was, you know, diagnosed with what we call as ADD. Uh, but I was a dreamer. I was always drifting and I was always. Uh, very unfocused on the world in front of me because I was a lot more entertained in a world of depth versus the outer world. And I was able to really, you know, come to a moment in time where I just had a period of radical acceptance. And I just said, in order for me to survive, I, I need to just you really put all that stuff away um, and just kind of bog that down. Uh, but But it was very hard, you know, moments in childhood, I would just have this inner premonitions of, of things that would come to pass. And I wouldn't refer to it as psychic intelligence or, or, or intuition. To me, this voice was just annoying where I would hear, th hear, hear things, know things and see things. And I wouldn't label it, but it was just very frustrating when they would just happen to me. And it was just rather scary, but I just held on to things. And 
Uh, there's things that are happening till this day that I saw as a child that, you know, that came to be. And even in life after breath on a micro macro basis, I talked about some world events that I saw that that came to pass. But on a micro basis, I became aware of, you know, a couple of different things throughout adolescence, throughout my childhood that would happen years later. Uh, so psychic awareness was a lot stronger from, from this experience. Uh, but, you know, there came a time where the survival that, you know, needed to happen and I needed to bog this down, but the ability to thrive, you know, needed to happen where I needed to make sense of all this and I need to be able to process this, not on the inner level, but uh, on the grounded outer level. Because what happened was inside of me never left me, but my ability to articulate it in the vernacular and to ground it, you know, needed to be processed. And, um, you know, it wasn't until I read a book by um, Betty Haiti, who wrote, you know, the book Embraced by the Life, which was actually gifted to me by a family friend who was when I was, you know, really starting to, you know, open up and that beach ball was coming to the surface again. And I was uh, really stepping into my own. And there was a lot more unencumbered and, and autonomy that was happening within my, within my own life. And this book, from reading it, you know, gave me a lot more universality of the near-death experience, where prior to reading Betty's book, um, I had no priviness or no awareness that other people had this experience. And so reading the book was a double-edged sword. On one hand, I, I had I had a sense of universality, I had a sense of, um, you know, understanding that this wasn't, you know, something that I only had, and those feelings of isolation, you know, of being different, that stuck with me for a decade or two, you know, went away. But on the other hand, I didn't, I didn't feel so special anymore. I felt like, oh, other people are having this and they're having, you know, these bestsellers and they're going on Oprah. So that part of holding on to the sacred experience, you know, lost its value. Uh, but from reading Betty's book, I understood that this was experience wasn't about me so much. It was really about other people. And I saw just how I benefited from it as a near-death experiencer. And I understood that, you know, life isn't really for us to hold on to, but our ability to let go. And, you know, I feel that we all have gifts within the backpack of life that we have, and we want to leave with nothing left to give, that all of our gems and all of our crystals and all of our rocks are gone. And at the end of the day, there's there's nothing more to give. And I think really this life is very much about impact and the ripple effect of things that will be here long after than when our bodies are here. And it's, it's, it's about the ripple effect. Um, and it's so, you know, for myself, it, um, you know, life after breath, I really chronicle, you know, a lot of the struggles of uh, living a life kind of like Benjamin Buttons in a sense, where I had you know, all this, you know, evolution, all this wisdom. But in order to, for me to fit in, I just had to kind of dumb that down and bog that down. And I was this three-year-old child that all of a sudden, you know, was aware of a lot, a lot of things that, you know, my peers were not aware of in a sense that my parents were just karmically tied to me, but they weren't really my real parents. You know, they were biologically, physically older than me, but they weren't older in awareness. And so, you know, that led itself to a very complex dynamic where, you know, it was very hard for me to feel, to, to listen to people who, who had a possessiveness of this paradigm that I was able to see through. Um, but I just, at a time, just had to play the game. But it was very hard for me to to be immersed in the world where people were so possessive of reality that I just knew was was not reality. It was it was it was a limited lower consciousness. Uh, but nothing really out of the blue happened to me up until you know my my probably my early twenties where I was really training in a lot of different meditative practices and I was starting to, like I said before, coming into you know, really who I truly was, this free spiritual being in this human body and learning how to channel, you know, that, that free spirit. Um, and moments later, I, a couple of years later, I began training and I just noticed, um, you know, myself that, that there was one day, you know, where I, you know, remembered where I just literally woke up and was out of my body. And I just, this was an experience that I felt, you know, a sense of like, here we go again, I'm having another NDE or, you know, the trauma came up again of having that, but this time I wasn't suffocated. My physical body was fine, but this was an OBE that I experienced. And this went on for several weeks where I literally was looking down on my body and I was able to be aware of the different energies that I had. And um, I became a sense of emotional where 
there's there's periods where I just couldn't couldn't stop crying or I just couldn't stop laughing. What it felt like was every part of the tension I had in my physical body was going away as if you take a wet towel and just wring every part of you that was was tense. And your, my spirit was able to be opened up from letting go of all those bricks in the hot air balloon. Um, and I was able to really rise in this hot air balloon of awareness. And there was moments, you know, where once again, you know, around two decades later of the high holidays again of September, you know, around this time, around two decades ago, where I was in a synagogue and I was aware that my third eye was just exploding and I felt a slow blinking eyeball that was just wet and pulsating. It was right in the middle of my eye. It was slowly blinking on and off and I was able to feel a fire right right in my lower back in a in a like an ocean like sensation in my own head and just this energy that really was was intensifying and moments later I felt wings building within my own shoulders and I was able to just ride wings of my own spirit totem, you know, which was you know, riding the entire room. And I was riding to the side of this and around it. And when I was riding on this, my animal totem, I became aware of this energy that united each participant, each congregant within the room. And this was kind of this, it was like this thread of energy that connected each participants. And I saw how people energetically were always connected, but they had their own egocentric thoughts and identity that they that was blocking them from the oneness that I saw, this this ocean of oneness. And in years past, I would read, you know, read through a couple books and philosophically understand that. But this was a knowing. This was happening right in front of me, much like my near-death experience. And I just saw this on a profound basis. And I saw that we are indeed all interconnected beings through this one strand of energy where there is no separation other than our own limited awareness. And that you could not not be who you are. You could think that, but you could not not be who you are. And who we are is just this eternal spiritual beings having this human experience, you know, infinitely connected within our own oneness. And I, I was able to really take that in and just saw how limited we truly are in our bodies. So many people within their own thoughts, their own separate egoic constructs and identities, and how that really could separate ourselves from the true reality at hand. And that's something that really I stick stick with every day, how we're truly all you know infinitely connected. And so that is something that I try to live with every day and finding different ways to really unify, to find ways, you know, to, to let go, as Rumi would say, windows without walls and just having pure sight, pure connection to who we are without barriers. And I think if we're able to do that, the world is such a more comfortable, you know, place because we become a brothers and sisters keeper, you know, in 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 this play, playground of life. And I know I had my experience within a playground, and I certainly experienced that we're all here just playing, figuring things out. We're all here, you know, for each other, for the sake of evolution, for the sake of growth, for the sake of experience in our own unique ways. And so, you know, during this time, I would imagine. Um, you know, you have a couple questions, I'm certain, and then maybe if we still have time, you know, I could do a closing guided meditation, you know, as so that hopefully at, at the very least you get a good night's sleep tonight. Um, you know, after the last, you know, couple of days that we had with, especially with the 20th anniversary of 9-11, which I know for a lot of my friends who are spiritual seekers and myself included, which was really a time of transformation and just when our consciousness shifted from you know getting off the programming of, of reality as we know it to say that in any moment reality as we know it could be taken away and you know how do we want to live our lives how do we want to view it and do we want to view it you know in the temporary day-to-day -day programming or do you want to view it from a larger you know broader perspective and you know i know um you know there's a saying that we want to change the morning of life into the afternoon of life and I know that that that, st that statement is by I believe Dr. Carl Jung, um, but but that means is changing the life that we've been programmed to in the morning of life, where it's about competition, it's about playing the game, it's about getting ahead, you know, to 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 go far, and then once we recognize that that really has no purpose or no meaning behind it, or no value, we start to get into the afternoon of life, which is really about meaning, it's about purpose, it's about the bigger picture. And certainly through 
um, traumatic experiences, through difficult experiences, we could have a higher value system of what's truly real, what's truly important, versus really rather what's temporary and not, you know, real, not that important, and letting go of the programming of the morning in life to get to the afternoon. And so if you guys have any questions, I'm not, I might be a young guy, but not so technically yes. astute, so please do ask. Jacob, uh, Greg uh, has uh, his hand up. Go ahead, Greg. Okay. Um, hi, hi, Jacob. Um, hi, hi, Greg. Thank you for sharing your, your experience. Um, here's what's fascinating to me, and I just, mm. um, and this is just curiosity. I can't remember being three, you uh, know? No. And, I, I can't I can't really either. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I guess yeah. I'm wondering if this uh, remembrance of your experience happened later in life, like just came back to you later, because it's so mm. detailed and so much more mature than a three year old mm. would, mm. would understand. You know? Yeah. No, that that's a wonderful question, you know, Greg. Um, what I would say is, we're not our chronological age as we know it. Um, and this experience wasn't happening to me, you know, at the core at, as a chronological being. I mean, part, I still had an attachment to that, but that three-year-old body was not the totality of who I was. Who I was was an infinite encyclopedia. It wasn't limited to that one page in one particular time frame. But I was talking about, you know, the effects of trauma, where I know at least I was in sixth grade when 9-11 happened in Queens, New York. And I remember every part of that day, as do most people, 9-11, and something so profound and so traumatic happens, we have the ability to really remember it on such a deep level. I mean, most of us don't remember what we were doing October 1st, 2021, or October 2nd, but remember 9-11. I think that has to do with, with trauma on the pure basic level and our ability to retain it. That and this experience was not produced by my brain. It wasn't produced by my linear brain. It was it was happened at a place in the disembodied state. It happened on the on another realm. And it was such a profound experience. It wasn't it it doesn't defy conventional memory. You know, it was something that happened not to my memory, but just through my being. And it was something so profound. And so what happened happened. I, I had an awareness that this happened to me on a soul level, which was purely aware of what was going on. But to answer your question, the series of events didn't change. It was always with me, but my ability to articulate it, to process it on an outer level evolved. And I, I kind of view it as, you know, you take a guitar player and they, and they have a guitar and the guitar, the guitar player has been playing for thousands of guitars, but now this is a different guitar. And so they're getting used to the instrument. And so I think that happens with the soul and the body. It takes time for the two to really synthesize and, and get used to the instrument and for the instrument to work itself out and run its course. But just because we don't show things on an outer level does not mean does not mean that things are happening. I think on the outer level is always just a surface of what's happening within the subconscious mind and, and to us in our deeper level. And so I think existence is not limited by what we see on an outer level, but there's so much more underlying levels that are happening of consciousness of reality as we know it. Uh, but if anything else, we are not our body. We are not our chronological age. We are not our names. We are, you know, these are just temporary expressions and personalities that we take on. But beyond that, we are infinite consciousness, just using this temporary body, this temporary lifetime as a, as a way to express itself, as a way to evolve, know itself. Beyond that is this infinite consciousness, you know, far beyond this temporary ego, this temporary body, this temporary name. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. That was a great question. Okay, uh, the other, Laurie has her hand up. Go ahead, Laurie. Hi, hi, thank you so much for sharing your transformative experience. My pleasure, Laurie. Thank you. Um, I did have, I have a number of questions, but I think one of uh, the thing I'm most interested in is, could you describe the, um, angels and the beings that you saw it sounds like you had were able to see quite a few different kinds of mm. angels like your guides uh, just in uh as what shape or form were they just a light being or um right the guides i have a very hard time describing because 
just just the beauty of them was so big. It was just like this this big massive, you know, light that was coming to me, and and the most beautiful faces and the most you know beautiful beings that you could possibly describe with looks that we can't describe. But they had a human element to them with just this mixed angelic features. And I think spirit guides are the most grounded to me. They have, at least from my experience, they have the most awareness of what it's like to be human and you know, they're the most earth-based in a way, whereas the angels that I saw, they were floating very peacefully up and down in front of me. And bear in mind, when I was looking at this, I became aware of a thought that just was like, is this really happening? I, I still had my own human, I still had my own consciousness. I still had my own human thoughts. And so there was like this, there was two things going on, was just this knowing what was happening, but also this um, incubation period of still that voice that was there. So there's like two, you know, awarenesses happening, you know, and eventually as time went on, I was able to really come into this, this place of pure awareness. But, you know, the angels were, I would say kind of like a gold or, or bronze kind of color. And they were very young. Um, I describe them, you know, I guess the word is cherubim or they're very, you know, young or childlike angels. They weren't mature in their presentation, whereas the spirit guides were, were mature, kind of middle age, whatever. These the, the angels that I saw in front of me were very childlike, and I could be aware of their own faces and, you know, their their wings, and they were flying up and down. And so I think when you look at art or any creative work, it has to come from somewhere. It just doesn't come from a place of randomness. So I can't say it's exactly what we see, you know. In, you know, it, it, you know, in churches and or you know, in any Christian Jojo's, you know, thing. But there are some some parallels in a way. But beyond that, there's just these colors that are beyond physical colors that we could see. Yeah, I could describe you colors that they were, but when you're going to these colors, they have such a more of of a depth to them. It's almost like you could feel the colors. You could go through it. It's as if you're on LSD and you see colors, you see them through like a, a deeper lens. Trust me, I don't have personal experience, but from my clinical awareness, you know, it's like you could just see things past the face value and feel it and have, have senses working on a much deeper level, you know, so that's kind of what was going on. But the sounds, the sights, and and just the awareness, there's just this infinite like army of, of angels that was right in front of me floating very peacefully and they were all very uniform, whereas the spirit guides that I saw were distinct. I was able to see, okay, this is male and female, you know, their names and stuff like that. And I, they had the most earthly like characteristics, but at the same time, they, they were just so otherworldly beyond this reality that I just, I'm sure to describe that because they were much bigger and their energy was just, you know, much larger in a way too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Any other questions? Donna. Go ahead, Donna. I'm not able to hear you. Hi, Jacob. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, wish you a Shana Tova. Uh, Me too. Happy, happy New Year. Um, and as a Jewish clergy, a uh, Chazan, um, I wanted to just, uh, I had my own experiences mm -hmm. and it, it just made me aware of so much more to the world and to God than what was, what I had ever learned in, mm -hmm. in my faith. So I was just, my question to you is how did this experience change your perception of the faith that you were that you were born into mm. and also you did mention something about in your journey how you had um had experienced what you would call christ consciousness mm. if you could uh define that for me as well thank you right right so i mean it, it would to you know if you if you purchase my book it you'll be able to have a lot more of an understanding of what that was like but for time's sake it was it was rather difficult uh because there's this monopolization you know of truth but but to me it was something outside of myself it was something that was that was taught to me and having this experience i i had an understanding that truth 
as I know it was in my own backyard. That it wasn't, you know, in the hands of someone powerful or someone holy, but rather something that I had within my own backyard. And so it was kind of like this Pisces, this Pisces Aquarius kind of thing or this, you know, kind of thing where it's just like this tradition versus, you know, um, you know, you know, freedom and, and innovation. It's something outside of it. And so it was a struggle. I I remember getting, and my mother will attest to this, that I once got in trouble from, from going in a playground, ironically, where this happened and screaming at the top of my lungs that your God does not exist. And so when I was a very young kid, I was very early on in elementary school. And so I grew up in a modern Orthodox home where there was very, very much ritualistic. It was, you know, in order for you to, to get God's love, you had to do all these things. And it was very difficult to abide by that, but I just almost had to just bog down my own stuff to just fit in. But I was, uh, I had a lot of rage to it that I wasn't able to express. Um, and so there was a lot of opposition, but I, I say the afterlife spirituality exists not because of religion, but despite of it. And, you know, um, religion is something that we're taught spirituality is who we truly are. And that's what I really experience. Now, you know, Christ consciousness is, is interesting because I, different than some other near-death experiencers, some are shown Jesus Christ in front of them. Uh, they might have different, you know, interpretations of it. But what I would say is, you know, the consciousness that I experienced was just the vibration or just the expression of an energy. You know, so, I, so I see, okay, you take the name of Donna Gordon, that's, you know, your physical body, but beyond that, there's an expression of you. There's a higher self. There's a higher energy beyond the form that you take. And I think Jesus took a form within the body, but beyond that was this, you know, this 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 part of the div, uh, part of the divinity that we has, and we all have that. Right. I think part of the life of Jesus was, I think, why people were really, I guess, he's the most popular man in history. The fact that he lived, you know, thousands of years ago and is still talked about regular basis is the fact that a part of us sees ourselves within that. I think that was the whole goal of that was just to see that we are these magnificent divine sacred beings. And, you know, that is just a mirror and a reflection of the consciousness that we know. Um, and so the one thing that I learned from, from having that was, you know, God and Jesus is bigger than the Bible. It wasn't limited by the Bible or wasn't limited by what was taught in it. And so I have my own, connection on my own level beyond the confines of of religion and my interpretation of god or jesus or all these beings is, is a very intimate one is a, is, a, is a consciousness that we have on a very intimate basis I, I think what happens is people get lost in the collective you know interpretation of it and they lose their own personal connectivity uh to it and so um i know neil donald walsh for instance wrote conversations with god um, which, which was a fantastic book if you haven't read it. But I think in our own way, we're all having an uncommon dialogue with God, whether we know it or not. You know, we're always talking. If you want to label it as God, if you want to label it as a higher awareness, whatever that is, you know, it's all just trickles of higher consciousness that we're all constantly communicating with, listening to it and guiding our everyday lives. And so I think it's very important to get rid of the label and to, and to remove... Um, a lot of judgments and just allow, you know, all these things to come into our own awareness and to stop stopping ourselves from, you know, consciousness flowing through us, not from us. Uh, but, but um, I've, I've had a, I've had a difficult time with it, but I, I think in a way everyone's on their own level of understanding, you know, and some fall easier to that in their own soul levels and stuff like that. And other people are able to really, live by their own drum of truth and to be empowered in it. Uh, but I don't blame them. Um, I, I, I think very early on, the spiritual experience is very disempowered. We are disempowered because we're reliant on our adults from a very young age. And so that's translated as if the adults are older than us, that they're wiser than us, that they have a possessiveness of something. Uh, but I think a lot of kids, you know, lose themselves in the way with, with that ideology instead of listening to it, or they have a very difficult time because they're able to see through it and there's a degree of opposition, you know, past a limited awareness of consciousness and an abandonment of what they know is as real and truth and, and just a conformity of the prism of reality, you know, constructed before them. And so you know, I think it's important 
to always find ourselves and sometimes be willing to lose ourselves in order to find ourselves. And that certainly happened within a lot of transformative experiences. And it's a very vulnerable place, but also the most rewarding position of our life that we could have. You know? Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Jack, you're next. Yes. <clears throat> uh, hello. <laughs> Uh, uh, Jacob, your picture vanished. Uh, uh, am I? Can can you hear me, everybody? Hello. I am, I am. But um, let me try to. I don't, I'm not sure why that happened. I'm able to see myself, but um, sometimes. No. That, yeah. Okay, everything's back to normal. Thank you. Well, this is really fascinating. I mean, I moved to New Jersey to be my wife and I to be near our grandchildren. Mm. Our a half year old son John. Mm. Uh, he, he's talking, and uh, uh, you know his uh, expressions are really very simple and uh, basically physical, etc. So I find this uh, your your experience as a three year old mm. uh, is amazing because um, you had an understanding of God at mm. the three. You had an understanding of heaven, mm. of angel. It's a, now, when you had that experience at three, when did you start uh, uh, kind of formulating uh, the verbal expressions of what transpired? I mean, right. uh, to have that kind of intricate memory is astounding. Now, I mean, of course, you have you have uh, uh, exceptional uh, children. I mean, um, Mozart was, uh, you know, he was playing, uh, he was playing the piano at five and, and uh, performing, I mean, so it's not, uh, I'm not questioning you. I understand. There, there is a, there's a big jump between your experience at three and this very complicated understanding of of uh, the other side, I mean, it's just mind-boggling. Right. So, when did, when did you start um, formulating, uh, or, or or translating, or recording um, that experience? At, at, you know, of a three-year-old. Right. Well, you know, that's a wonderful question. I this experience, like I said before, is not of a three-year-old. None of our experiences are. We're not our limited chronological age. We're eternal spiritual beings having this human experience. Um, but you know, I think kids in general, we really see, or infants, we really see in a very limited pathologized way. We look at them as blank canvases or synonymous with the body and what's happening. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I look at, you know, you could have young people who are very wise and old people who forget. Um, it's not synonymous with intellectual development or psychological, emotional development. Wisdom is who we truly are. It's 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 a core of our being. And so I look at kids or infants quite differently, where they're reincarnating from the other side. They have a lot more clarity. They're a lot more connected on a deeper inner level. Um, of their being, they have a lot less separations of, of the of the brain and the mind, which is really just the filter of consciousness. And as we get too much in our own head, you know, the left brain is quite limited. And so, for us to come from this, from the intellect, is very limited. We're talking about the infinite, and we're coming from it from a finite mind. Really, in order for us to understand the infinite, we have to come from a greater depth of our own being or, or a greater uh, angle, uh, because you know, it, the finite mind, it d doesn't understand this stuff. And most of us are, are really in that left brain. And so we forget this infinite mind that we have and our ability to understand that all truths are merely simple, that they're not complicated, that they're in the doorways of our own backyard. And so I was able to have this experience that I really held very much sacred into my life. Uh, but I tried to bog it down almost to fit in. You know, it wasn't until I read a book by Betty Eighty, which which really gave me a universal understanding of what this was. I, I didn't have a terminology or, or a lexicon for the near-death experience. I just thought this was a profound experience that I didn't even want to bother telling people because it was so sacred. It was so 
preferred within my own heart. And if you ask near-death experience researchers, uh, one of them is PMH Atwater. Uh, she will tell you that it takes you know, children or most adults around 20 to 30 years to have the language, the words, and the ability to integrate their experiences. Um, and I, I think that's deadly accurate. It took me around that time not to process this on an inner level, but to have the words to really articulate it. And so once I really read Betty's book, I was able to have words to describe it and to have an understanding that people were able to hear this stuff, that I wouldn't, I wasn't going to be ostracized, that there was, um, you know, people who really were able to understand this. You know, so Betty's book gave me a great deal of confidence, as well as universality and lexicon behind the terminology of what I experienced. As a psychotherapist, you know, I could really understand the limitation of a diagnosis, but also the freedom that it gives. You know, it's no different than let's say someone has bipolar, PTSD. They're having all of these incredible experiences that I don't know where to start, where to begin, where to end. And so they really internalize it. There's a lot of it is suppressed, depressed. And once you say you, you have PTSD, you have bipolar, you have you know, borderline person, whatever that is, a light bulb flips off and all of a sudden they take a lot more ownership and empowerment of their experience and they're able to integrate themselves in the world instead of hiding and bogging down all those emotions. So, you know, there is a power, you know, to words, there's a power to vernacular, there's a power to diagnosis, uh, but it's also important to not be limited by that and to take ownership of each experience as a unique entity in itself. Well, okay. It, it, I, I still haven't been able to make the connection between the experience, the, the very complicated, sophisticated experience at the age of three, and when you started to. Uh, yeah. did, did you actually recall the details of that? Yeah. Yes. It, it, it was all recalled, it was all remembered, uh, it was all there. Um, you know, my suggestion would maybe, you know, because I know we have other people with hands, my suggestion would maybe to email me, you know, some of your other questions or to sit with it for for a period of time. Uh, but to answer your question, it was all there. I just very much kept it, you know, close to me and I wasn't, uh, you know, talking about it or putting it that out there, you know, so, you know, I well, hope the, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the many and the ears that have heard their stories over the past 35 years. It doesn't matter how long ago it happened, mm. 20 years, 25 years, when they finally talk about it, they remember it in detail. Mm. And so I'm trying to understand uh, uh, the, the, how uh, the, the memory, well, you, you know, you, you talked about feeling your brain uh, at, the, uh, at that time sort of snap mm -hmm. on or something. I mean, I, I mean, the brain is incredible. And, and, and uh, so uh, I'm not questioning it. I'm, I, 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 yeah. Three year old where you recorded this information wow. and 10, 20, 30, 20 years later, you, you started to uh, 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 record it and exp explain it, that's all. So uh, my question is, when did you start looking into it? Is, well, is I, I, it, there, there was always a time where I was looking into it, but I you know, started publicly, I would say in my mid-20s was when I first started publicly talking about it. So, And why, why in your mid-20s? What was turning you in, in, in that direction? That's when I was really able to process the experience and make sense of it. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I mean, really, this is a fascinating experience. I'm, I'm so thankful that you shared it with yeah. us. Okay. Bethany, you're next. Wow. Jacob, thank you so much for um, sharing your story with us. My today. pleasure. And I really have enjoyed the questions um, and your responses that my colleagues, my peers, uh, my friends have asked. Um, I have two questions. One is about guides and the other is about your OBEs. Although I find the experience mm. you had in the synagogue to be um, very interesting as well. Um, 
but the, the guides, I wanted to ask if your um, guides are available to you, um, if you ever reach out to them, um, if they're available to you at any time. They, they always are, uh, but you know, my ability to see and feel them isn't as clear as my, within my own near-death experience, obviously. Uh, but it's like a trickle of consciousness. And, you know, my own brain, you know, I think really blocks a lot of that pure awareness and being in the body, you know, it's harder in many ways to have that degree of clarity, uh, but they're always there. And, you know, every day I wake up, you know, asking my guides for a message of the day or, or something that, you know, people need to hear. And so they always come to me on a daily basis where I have daily posts and daily messages and I, and I hear them. And, you know, they're always talking through us. We may not notice it, you know, when we make that turn and all of a sudden, you know, an accident happens or you're that person that we need to call. We hear that whisper and we just call them. We haven't thought of them in years and they're going through a difficult time. You know, so spirit is always talking. You know, our job is really to trust, you know, and listen. Um, but I communicate them usually you know, later at night when my brain starts starts to slow down a bit, um, you know, that's when they're really able to come a lot easier. I think when we're too much, we're doing too much stinking thinking, it's hard. You know, I I view I view intuition or or the messages from the guides as if you're in a room and you hear everyone in the room talking, and you're trying to distinguish a voice, and that's kind of what happens when you have so many thoughts in your head. And I think when you're quiet within your own mind you know, in your own heart, the waters of truth, you know, present themselves to you. And I really think, you know, meditation, you know, and learning how to get quiet um, is important, but it's important because the quieter you get, the more that you're able to feel a symmetry of a near-death experience. You're able to have rapport as well as a connection with eternity. You're just aware that there's a part of you that exists far beyond the thoughts, the emotions, and doing it consistently, you just know when this body goes, you'll take that awareness with you. You know, that is you at, that, at a deeper level, you know, and that's something that's not produced by the brain, not limited by the body, but your own soul's awareness. And you take that with you, you know, when the body, you know, has an expiration date. So I think if anything else, you know, having a couple moments of intimacy with eternity is what I view as, as meditation you know, and, and it's on a deeper level. So um, I think the good news is that, you, like I said before, you don't have to die to have a near, to, to have eternity. And, and more importantly, you don't have to go through the trauma or some of the difficulty that, you know, some of us near-death experiencers go through with, you know, talking about our experience and some people question, you know, it, you're able to have your own experience and unique in, in itself and not have to go through all that degree of trauma or ostracization you know, that, that people go through and have it on your own level. Um, so I'm almost jealous of people who didn't have this is people are jealous of me, but I say, wow, you know, you didn't have to go through all that degree of trauma and all these you know, people looking at you, judging you and all that stuff. You could just be you. Uh, but I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world because I think it's, it's about others and it's about having that ripple effect and reminding people of who they truly are and what they're infinitely connected and letting go of what we've been taught and some of the limitations that our own mind presents. Mm. Um, thank you for that. I find you a very eloquent speaker. Um, I wondered about the OBE experiences that you talked about mm. as well. Um, and I didn't capture all the details, mm. but I wondered is um, you, you spoke about having a number of them in succession and I wondered um, if that was something that you invited or something that was helping you resolve something. Yeah, you know, I think in a way, any transformative, profound experience, I do believe, is in the pre-birth period of our lives in, in a way. Sometimes those timelines of those occurrences happen earlier or later. But I, I view it as if there's this, there's this lobster shell that we have and this 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 you know connection with consciousness that we have and then once we evolve once we let go of that we just let go of that shell and have you know a new outlook a new way of being 
And so I think in a way it was just this phase of consciousness that I was experiencing that I can no longer put on and just this bubble of consciousness bursting to get to a new level of, of outlook. Uh, but one thing that I learned is, you know, people ask me about the other side and uh, there's no monopolization of eternity. You can't finite the infinite. It's it's infinite. And there's an open-endedness, you know, to, to consciousness. It's It's ever ending. And that keeps life exciting. There's always different ways to look at consciousness. There's always different ways in understanding, you know, to, to have awareness, you know, invite that in your everyday life. Uh, but I think it's important to understand that a radical change could happen at any moment in time. You know, I've seen it to countless colleagues of mine, but from our ability to be in a positionality of, re of receiving and, and an openness, you know, that's when those things could happen. But Contrary to what we've been taught, it's not through muscling them or trying to force them. You know, force tends to burn ourselves out. And when we try to force life, it tends to burn ourselves out. It's when we connect to our own inner power that power reinvigorates power. But force, when we try to force life, we try to muscle life, you know, that's when we get depleted and, you know, very little life happens. So this is really about expanding and connecting to your own power so that you have the ability to invite these expansive you know, periods of consciousness to come into your life, not trying to muscle it or force it, but just simply allowing your life to unfold as it is. And, you know, you're able to have these incredible experiences, however profound or, 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 or however small. If you can't see the sacredness in the small stuff, you can't really see the sacredness in the big stuff either. You know, you have to see it in all. So true. Thank you so much. Thank you. Greg, you're next. Hi, me again. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, I actually, I, a couple things. So first, uh, Jack's question, and, and I guess my question, which was similar, and, and you're talking about, kind of brought me back, and this is inconclusive to me still, but once at this group, same, very group, we met in person, and this was like several years ago when I was actually able to physically go. Um, we always would say, hi, I'm Greg, and, you know, I'd never had a near-death experience, and someone else would say, um, that's my kid in the background. Um, <laughs> someone else would say their name and then say, I had almost like, you know, and I had a near-death experience. And one of the members of the group actually said, you know, Greg, I think you did have a near-death experience. You just don't remember it. And, right. and I don't know, I was thinking about that, and I, I'd still inconclusive. I mean, maybe I did at one point in, when I was very mm. little, and, and um, maybe I didn't. Um, but the thing I actually, the one question I do want to ask actually is your, it sounds like you're a psychologist. Um, and how does your experience play into therapy, helping people? Cause you got, they gotta be open to that too. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, certainly I've, I've been able to run a lot of therapeutic support groups and I use the word support, uh, because people, when they go to support groups, they're, they're looking to be heard, um, they're looking to be validated, um, they're looking for their experiences to be felt in a deeper level without judgment or analysis and just the ability to listen, you know. And so when I was I was able to run support groups for these experiences, uh, but the interesting part is, you know, the angle that it comes at it. For instance, people who have multiple personalities or schizophrenia, you know, stuff like that, it's just interesting to see or differentiate, you know, if that's, you know, happening, you know, on a psychological level, or is there, is this an energetic thing? There's this, you know, something happening at a deeper level. And it's, it's a case by case situation, but I just sit to myself, how many people have we medicated who could have been profound medium to have had these experiences? How many people do we, you know, put bars of, of, of medicine and psychiatry, and just bogged down their experiences when they could have, you know, they could have, changed the world. I know, for instance, George Anderson, who is, you know, like a big medium here in Long Island and one of the, uh, you know, just, just, just really pioneers of mediumship. When he was younger, living in Long Island, they put him in a psychiatric facility because he was having these experiences. Uh, but, but I say at times, you're not sick. You could be psychic. You know, you could have a lot of this stuff. And so, you know, for myself, I, I, I try to look at people from an angle of looking up at them and not down on them. I find in the field of psychology, it's a very much a limited basis where 
we're pathologizing people, we're labeling people. And I said labels have their own, you know, value, but it's not it's not the all. And a lot of the labels are very pathologically based. They don't tell the full story, you know, of a person. They just look at symptom. They look at, you know, a lot of the difficulties that a, that a person is experiencing, but they don't tell anything about the experiencer. And so, um, you know, I try to look at people from the same way of my angels, which is a way of understanding, a way of compassion, a way of looking up and not down. I think when we judge, when we analyze, that's when we really look at it from our angle and we're able to take ourselves out of the picture to really allow ourselves to join in that person's experience and to really admire as they are. And I try to view people as a sunset. We don't look at a sunset and say, hey, I don't like that sunset. I don't like the way that it's going. We just sit back and watch it unfold. And I think the same th same thing with people. We just allow them to unfold and we and I try to look at them through through the eyes of God. And um, I think that's the closest thing to God is is being able to constantly reflect in our ability to look at others from the lens and eyes of God as, as God would see it, as God would feel it. As you know, someone once said to me, how could you possibly doubt yourself if you are a part of God? Then to doubt yourself is to doubt God. And I think that's important to recognize how truly powerful, magnificent, divine we all are. And we have to remember you know, that part of us. My wife had a quick question. She doesn't want to get in camera, though. Yeah. I, I, I understand. Go ahead. Uh, well, you're jumping the camera on stuff. No, but you're not on camera. All right. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yes, I'm able to hear you. Okay. I just had a question. I was wondering what your parents thought about your experience, like what their reaction was. And I actually watched an NDE story um, over the weekend at my job. Well, see, so I do overnight shifts and I work with, um, but so I work with women who have been through trauma. They're recovering from substance abuse addiction. They, most of them had had trauma in their lives. And, but during the overnights, they pretty much sleep unless like somebody wakes up and, you know, anyway. <laughs> So I don't have a lot to do after I do the paperwork, except to make sure everybody's point. safe. <laughs> I'm, look, I'm not talking, Greg. Um, I was watching this story. This four-year-old girl had an NDE, and when she told her mom, her mom didn't really believe her. She was mm. just kind of like, okay. And the four-year-old girl was like, yeah, I saw Jesus, and mm. he gave me a hug, and I saw rainbows, and and, you know... And he told me I had to go back, and but the mother like didn't really believe. Her. She like believed her later on in life, but then when she was four, she just thought, okay, she like mm -hmm. she was just telling a story. So, yeah, you know, I I knew instantaneously that my mother had no idea where I was, and I wasn't able to have the words to describe it. As a therapist, it's so profound to be very selective with where you place your vulnerabilities and where you place your grief. Um, and so I think it's very important to have a readiness to talk about and to understand it takes time. Just because it's not spoken doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I mean, a lot of people suppress, you know, and hold stuff, you know, very close to heart that's happened when there is a readiness, they talk about it. Uh, but for that, that exact reason, you know, that I really wasn't ready to have it where it's just, you know, I just felt I wasn't ready for people to reject it or to disbelieve it. And that would disempower it. Had I done that, I may not be here in this chair today. You know, had I gone on and talked about it, I, I, I could have easily just been very disempowered from it and not. Do, so there's a reason for everything. But I think timing is everything. And I came out when I was ready, when I took an ownership of it. And I encourage I encourage everyone to really trust in you know their own time frame to come out in their own ability of comfort, to not rush it, and you know, and to not feel that you're being judged just because it's not doesn't happen when someone else does it or that that it's invalidated because someone else feels that way uh, but I but I think um, you know I, I didn't tell my parents until I was probably in my later 20s it took me a long time because they come from a very academic analytical background but when I found that I did that I was very grounded in my experience and when I was grounded I wasn't going to be swayed either way of what they thought about it because I said this is Got nothing to do with my experience, but everything to do with their own consciousness. I was grounded, and that took that took decades. It took a long time, but I was able to find help from it. But they were able to, you know, it, in prior videos, you know, near death experiencers don't know about age. So, 
in interviews, I was like, I don't know, four, I would say four or five, but they said you were three. And you know, I knew at a deeper level that I was three, but it was almost my own skepticism. I was like, wow, that was that long ago. It felt like just yesterday when this happened. And so, you know, I think when, when you are ready, it's very important to do it um, when you feel that sense of readiness, but you have to be grounded because if you're not grounded, potentially, I mean, that, that could really deflate the experience and a very disempower its trajectory for maybe your whole lifetime. And so, yeah, it's important to, to have that, that ability of readiness and groundedness in your experience from anything, no matter what it is, whether that's loss, whether that's a traumatic experience, you know, never feel rushed or pressured by what everyone else is doing. You have to go with what's right in you. Laura, you're next. Thank you, Jacob. You really do have a gift with words and making your audience feel that you care about them. And uh, I like the way you talked about looking up at people. Um, my near-death experience was very brief and it was caused by toxic mold exposure. And like you, with uh, many people with psychological issues, um, I wonder how many people are medicated who are actually being toxically poisoned by mold. But that's... Uh, uh -huh my own experience was I had psychological issues from mold, mold poisoning. You talked about the veil being very thin and I, I, I feel that um, I experienced it um, and I'm able to sense uh, spirit now, which is just wonderful. It's new to me and I'm uh, trying to uh, learn ways to channel or um, be more open to receiving messages that I get. Um, so I take it as a, um, you know, as it is a truly magical experience, even if it's a very tiny feeling I get or, or experience that happens to me, like you mentioned. Um, but I was wondering in your, uh, in your experience, you mentioned that you were bargaining, that you felt guilty, ashamed, um, and I was just wondering, did you feel older than you actually were? Yes. When I was there, you know, I was definitely connected to my soul, which I said before, isn't, you know, produced by the body, you know, it's rather filtered through it, but, but, but we're, we're not limited by, by the chronological age. That's, that's different. You know, this was, this was a, an experience of the soul, you know, not, and not necessarily my three-year-old self, but I still had, a degree of connection to the ego of that three-year-old personality, you know, the family that I had, you know, for my own fears or my own, you know, just concerns as to what would happen or where this was going. Uh, but I was aware that I was beyond that three-year-old body that, you know, there was an infinite consciousness that just took that body as an experience and a personality, but that was a, that was a limited, you know, interpretation of, of the totality of my being. Yes, thank you. I had just one more quick question. You mentioned that you were shown a past life. Um, could you just expand that on that a little bit more? Yeah, you know, if you read my book, Life After Breath, you know, I, I experienced a couple different carnations. But you know, the one that was most closest to me was when I, you know, committed suicide. I was a teacher of students. And, you know, just uh, I, I, I took my own life. I just, my back hit the wall. I saw just you know, a period of that lifetime where I saw no hope and, you know, I just, I just took my own life. Uh, and, you know, what that, that lifetime was really, I do believe from completion would begin, you know, in many ways. And, and certainly with suicide, you know, a lot of times people will carnate a little quicker, you know, sometimes, and they're not usually on the other side as long, but usually your experience you know, you're able, to, you, you want to evolve and, and learn that. I think we all have a deeper knowing of that, of, of truth, but it's about the integration of it. And that becomes a deeper part of ourselves. And so I think there's a lot of allegorical reference to the suicide that I had with my near-death experience. But at the very least, to just re the, the recollection of who you are and, you know, and, and the infinite love that connects you and the clear understanding that you can never be truly damaged. You can never be, you know, truly uh, destroyed. You, you, you are not limited by your own, you know, periods of suffering beyond that. You're an infinite eternal being, you know, and you have to remember that regardless of what I'm going, going through temporarily, 
you know, I can never truly be damaged. I can never truly be harmed. I, I'm just going through this through, through an experience and an ability to trust, you know, in what's inside of me. It's infinitely greater than infinitely, in, you know, in front of me and trust the love inside of myself and around me as a superpower. I think human beings forget how much love they have inside of them and how much love they have around them. And they really underestimate that superpower. And when the outside world is deprived of that, we have a decision to make. We tap into that infinite part of who we are and what's inside of us, or are we disempowered and we are we a leaf in water with the turbulence outside of us. And there's an eye within every hurricane certainly within ourselves no matter what's happening outside of ourselves there's an infinite interconnection and so having this near-death experience having the suffocating experience losing my breath i could go to the depths of human suffering and tell you that from looking at that straight at the eyes that infinite light is all that there is and ever was and everything else is just a mere you know temporary distraction or turbulence uh but you know it doesn't doesn't have much power. It comes back to the nothingness that which it came. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? It's a nice mantra to have love is a superpower. <laughs> yeah, Bethany likes that one. That's great. Right, right. <laughs> we're, we're taught many superpowers that go, don't get us anywhere, you know, so. Okay, so Sue is next. Uh, great talk. Uh, well, I you. found uh, your information very in-depth and uh, really eloquent. So uh, my question is uh, a lot of uh, people, when they have the near-death experience when they are grown-ups, and after the experience, they totally changed, uh, almost like a different person. And they view relationships differently. And it seems like to me, they're more uh, calm mm. um, and uh, more accepting of life. Because you had a near-death experience at a three-year-old. Of course, you will not be able to compare uh, to a life if you were three and didn't have the experience. So I was wondering, when you have the experience that early on, does it have an impact on your relationships, for example, with your parents? When you're going through, like, for example, teenage years, are you like a typical kid or are you like totally different, can see from a higher perspective and therefore have um, like a cope with uh, the stress and the relationships better with your parents and relatives. Right. So, um, so that's my question. No, I would say no one is immune from pain. No one is immune from some of the hardships. And I think those experiences are there not to break you, but to, but to make you in a way and, and to allow you to evolve to greater depths of strength. Everyone has their own unique experiences and their own uh, trajectories. Um, you know, I, I was what I would say a very difficult child in many ways. And I do attribute a lot of that to the trauma that I experienced. I wasn't on a behavioral basis. It was more on um, an ability to, to just be assertive against the world that I walked into. And I knew so much and I saw so much that it was very hard for me to just be a leaf in water. It was very hard for me to comply with the value system and, and just the conveyor belt development when I was taken off of this, you know, kind of, you know, conveyor belt, so to speak. And so I had a very hard time having the same value systems of the world outside of myself. I was also very, you know, much in tune with, with imagination, with dreaming, mm -hmm. with, with looking at life through a very deep angle. I was very introverted, very to myself. I never quite fit in, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I, in order for me to survive, I had to find some stuff, you know, to align myself with peers. And so I found sports to be a, a great universal, you know, outlet. And that's kind of what allowed me to fit in, so to speak. But you know, beyond that, I just, when, when everything got quiet, I just never felt the same with my peers. I always felt older. I felt mm -hmm. that I was like a grandfather with grandkids half the time. And some of the stuff that I would see was bad. I wasn't behavioral. I just was very 
argumentative, very stubborn, but I, I call that um, very strong-willed and, and very grounded um, in my ability to just be connected, which a lot of kids aren't. I, I wanted to create my own current and not to be a leaf in water from a very young age. Mm-hmm. And so it was very hard for me to play the game and to abide by, you know, the intense rules that I had through a religious background and mm-hmm. you know, through the paradigms that I kind of faced and taking it you know, seriously or, or I was able to see, I, was, I had too much knowledge that I probably shouldn't have had and that made it a little bit more difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Jacob, we're so grateful that you volunteered to uh, end this group with uh, a meditation. Yeah, yeah, I, I would like to. Um, and, and, if, and if anyone is interested, Life After Breath is available on Amazon, Kindle, paperback. And I'm also working on my next book called The Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. So stay tuned for that book. But Life After Breath is... You know, published by Waterside and available on Amazon. So feel free to take a look. And uh, I really have to thank you for all of your energy, all of your questions. Um, you know, I think in the way um, the experience was the experience, but each time that I come at it, I come learning something different. And that's from yeah. you guys. You guys make yeah. me look at a different angle. So you guys are my teachers. So I have to thank each and every one of you. We'll yeah, definitely that. promote you in our on our website, your book Thank and you. your website. Okay. Thank you very much, Jacob. Appreciate it. Okay. And so during this time, I'd like to close. Um, now, if you can, if you're able to, just place one or two hands on your heart, or you could use your mind's eye to go to your heart. And Allow yourself to take a deep inhalation for a couple of moments. So when you inhale, you want to inflate and feel your chest filling with air for a couple of moments. And exhale, you slowly want to deflate. And noticing your body changing as it's filling up with your breath as you're becoming aware of it and starting to feel your body becoming softer and more of an more of an ally and less something that's going against you. Allow yourself to become one with this moment, one with your body, one with your breath. Visualize during this time beautiful white light pouring itself down through the tops of your heads, down into your neck, shoulders, back, lower back, hips, legs, knees, ankles, and feet. Feeling your entire being surrounded by this beautiful white light surrounding you, allowing yourself to breathe in and become one with this one light, letting go of any separation, any self-limiting belief system, allowing yourself just simply to take a step back, just observe your feelings, observe yourself becoming aware this beautiful light surrounding you, just allowing it to feel, touch, and go in deeper and deeper into your entire being. Now, allow yourself to feel a beautiful candle sitting itself in the middle of your forehead. Visualize this flickering flame right in the middle of your forehead allowing this flame to feel a radiance of light, of warmth, of support to you, and allowing yourself to feel any excess of thought, tension, worry, or tightness in your brain or in your body to solely be freed and let go and releasing any of that tight point any of that 
tension that you might feel. So at this time, your entire body and brain feels very soft and you're wringing out all the tension of the day that you feel so that you could be in this moment, in this chair, in this space. Now, with your hands in your heart, feeling the love in your heart and focusing all that you were loved and loved by, having a clear knowing that you are pure, infinite, eternal, divine being, simply having a human experience, a temporary human experience. Allow yourself to take a step back to feel, sense, and know the beauty and eternity of the soul's journey that you have. Allowing yourself to rise above any worry that you have, anything that you're holding that might be weighing yourself down, feeling yourself straightening it up for men to wait on the backpack that might be holding you down a little bit. And allow yourself to breathe in into the depths of your heart for just a couple of moments, just being in this place of stillness. The stillness truly does speak and allowing yourself just to simply let go when you let go, your consciousness and awareness grows. Just simply letting go, allowing yourself to let go. Allowing yourself to trust in letting go. To trust in letting go. There is strength. There is wisdom. There is beauty. And you're able to feel more like yourself and letting go of any limitations that you have, any tensions, any blockages, from your pure freedom to express your true unencumbered self. And allow yourself during this time to send a positive thought or energy to anyone in your life that might need a little bit of light and any bit of darkness could be your community, the world around you, just visualizing this entire world filled with its true nature, its true light, beings remembering their true selves and their true light, allowing the world to letting go of anything that separates this pure infinite light connecting the world to this pure light and allowing yourself to validate yourself. You are a strong, resilient, empowered, beautiful, infinite being for being here during this time. The guides in the heavens are so proud of you and you are perfect just as you are. There's nothing that you need to be or do. Just simply need to remember who you are and come from that place of remembrance, of recollection, and live your life from that true place of who you are. We are all just a human being, not a human doing. We are a spiritual being. And as the being true to ourselves, being connected to ourselves, being in the moment that we're able to live a brightly guided life. Now, allow yourself to let go and to shed any of past limitations or past judgments that we've been taught. Allowing yourself to look at our eyes through the eyes of a child, to curiosity, exploration, wisdom to constantly see ourselves in a more beautiful, more loving, more accepting way, and letting go of, of the eyes of the world. Do not allow the world 
to take over your mind. Allow your mind to take over the world. And now, allowing yourself to be connected, letting go of what we walked into. When you're ready, smiling to yourself at the beauty of your own being, depths of your strength. And you're just here. It's just a learning experience, it's an ability to grow. It's just simply just a beautiful experience in time and space. We are so blessed to be here right now having this unique moment and unique experience with each other and just simply take all each other in, allowing yourself to feel the love that you are, embrace yourself with compassion, with wisdom, with grace, and feel the love around you that never left you, even if it feels like you left it. And slowly when you're ready, allowing yourself to come back down to your body, down, 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 and feeling your body in harmony with no separation, with your pure infinite light. You are the light. Slowly when you're ready, opening up your eyes, noticing how you're looking up at life and not down on it. You're looking at it through an ability to be present, through curiosity, exploration, and a place of pure joy and pure love. Imagination over regurgitation. And slowly when you're ready, you could just gently open up your eyes. Just feel on a deeper level. Thank you all for inviting your minds, your hearts, your beings to be here. To remember who we are, to re-remember who we are, who you are, so that we can remember who we are. Thank you. Jacob, great job. Thank you very much. Uh, when uh, we have the, the video ready, we will send it to you. Thank you. No, have thank a good you. Night. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. Take Bye care. Now. Thank you. Looking thank forward you. to reading your book. My honor. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye now.